This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve Dash Masterclass. Oh, he's okay. muted. Uh oh. Oh no, I like I was I was unmuted. You're ready, you're ready to go. That's, yeah, that's so true. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage the lovely Matt Hollerbach from Breaking the Mark. Hello, Put how your are you? hands together. What are Good we um so I don't know if if you guys missed it, but um Matt proposed a drinking game. Matt, do you remember the rules? I, I do. It was it was a bit of a joke. I think if I try and follow that i'll be run out of run of alcohol at my house within a couple hours but uh, the uh well, yeah the see. rules were uh one drink for uh geometric two drinks for rebalancing three drinks for ergodicity and then if you feel like uh, being aggressive go ahead and uh, go 2.7 times of that for the full kelly experience yes i like I it i like that yeah ladies and, um, and gentlemen this is how nerds party <laughs> <laughs> So Slightly you, better than the Dungeons and Dragons that, party 7? you guys have every Wednesday. I don't know. <laughs> What'd you say, Adam? Two point seven. I did just, you, I, yeah. Did, did you leave a margin of safety on that one? No, I didn't. I went all the way on that. Uh, That's I full figured. Kelly. The yeah, two point seven Kelly. times. Right. 2. Gotcha. 7. That is aggressive. No wonder you're uh, a little bit gun shy. Um, <laughs> what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking uh, Smithix. I had it left over from uh, St. Patrick's Day, so I got to keep going with it. Yeah, matches, right on. Good the beard too. So. Thanks for ready. What are you drinking, uh, Mike? I'm having a swell. I'm trying to use up some of these these uh, kids' drinks my kids left here. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> Rodrigo, what's going I on? I got a little bit of gin tonic to switch it up. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few words about this beer, which is uh, called Freestyle by Cayman Brewery, and it's only three grams carbs, 90 calories. It's light beer. So I was just thinking if we're going to play this you mean our game sponsor? properly. Yeah, I know. We should be <laughs> we should be soliciting some sponsorship the dollars from K, K Brew, I think. But um, in the meantime, it's just a really good beer. Anyways, welcome, Matt. We're really excited to have you on. Um, I'm excited to be here too. This is fun. Matt and I were chatting earlier in the week about um, just how much a lot of our thinking kind of overlaps. Obviously, it's not perfect overlap, but there's just a lot of common themes, and um, so. The, um, you know, we, we were pumped to get Matt back on. Matt was on a podcast. When was that? About a year ago now, maybe a little less. Uh, it was June, June or May. I think it was June, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what? Yeah, eight or nine, times all nine, blurred nine, last year as to what, what a year actually yeah, is. But. That is true. Yeah. And, um, and I think at that point you had written maybe, uh, maybe a dozen or maybe less articles in your, in your series on, um, sort of the theme of, of your the, the concept you're calling geometric rebalancing mm -hmm. and um so we try to cover a lot of the concepts there and i know that your thinking has evolved even further since then so looking forward to bringing everyone up to date on your thinking and um maybe trying to try to close a loop a little bit on um some of the the more nuanced differences between um some of the ways that we have traditionally thought about the problem and some of the strategies that we run and, and the strategy that you've been running um, successfully for, for a while. So um, maybe I think it'd be helpful if you could sort of introduce yourself and, and give us your background, which is a little unusual for somebody who's now um, thought of as kind of a novel thinker in finance and then um, kind of bring us up to date in terms of your journey. Okay, sure. Space. Before we do that, none of this is advice, right? True. And if you're Especially not what Mike says. Yeah. <laughs> And if you're going to try and get advice, don't get it from uh, the four people having beers on a Friday happy hour. <laughs> Especially Probably the second half of this less advice. Other, <laughs> other, well, this is when it gets good is about 60 minutes from now. So, <laughs> all right, let on with the fodder. 
and then we'll get, get us to the exciting stuff. Anyway. Okay. Now um, you're clear to go. So I am, uh, I am a mechanical engineer by degree uh, and background. I've spent my uh, entire career doing engineering, designing uh, uh, buildings and facilities, and then helping people manage and maintain them. Um, and now I kind of manage a team of people that, that does that. So uh, my background is not from engineering. Um, I have a pretty strong math background um, and, of course, a engineering problem solving type background. Um, and I've been in, interested in investing for a long time, really got more into it around the uh, uh, financial crisis back in 2008. I'm just intrigued by the problem of how, how, to, uh, how to invest and how to, how to grow your wealth. Um, and, um, just kept studying and researching and trying to learn more and more about it. Um, and, uh, I've poked away, you know, poked away learning as much as I can. And, you know, originally I think a bit like you, Adam, I kind of thought maybe people could predict these things or have an idea on the future. And, uh, after enough time of seeing people not be very good at a lot of that, generally speaking, even people that were right for a couple of years, all of a sudden become very wrong for a few years. Uh, I kind of became a little disillusioned with that. So I started paying a lot more attention to just randomness and how that works and how you uh, how you should understand randomness and if there's anything to gain from doing so. And I came to the conclusion that I think you, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I came to the conclusion that uh, that you can gain a little bit from randomness if you're paying attention to what you're doing and, uh, you know, monitoring where the, mar the, where the markets are. So I, I came up with a strategy that seemed to work pretty well and decided to create a blog to tell the world about it and talk about it. It's called breakingthemarket.com um, where I describe the strategy and then I describe the concepts of viewing the market around the idea of geometric growth um, and that the market is... Okay, there's is, geometric. You guys yeah, are just not one. doing a very good job of playing along here. Uh, I, uh, I, I heard it. I just ignored it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I the blog, it took a little while like most blogs do, um, but I got a little bit of traction and uh, people started paying attention to some things I was saying. And... Um, yeah, and then it kind of blew up from there, and so I, I got a little bit of a following. It's not as big as a lot of people on FinTwit, but um, you know, and and I've had a lot of people reach out to me, and uh, the the ideas and concepts I've talked about have seemed to do fairly well. So I uh, I decided through COVID and sticking at home last year that I uh, wanted to try and push it in a further direction. So I went out and decided to start a company uh, called Pronghorn Analytics to figure out how to implement this for. Um, for other people, um, implement these strategies and similar, and, and and you know, you know, still take the concept of geometric balancing to a, to another level. Okay, well, don't leave us hanging. What what is this concept of geometric rebalancing, and, and how do you think it differs from? How, how would you sort of map it in the sphere of more familiar type of of strategies, and then how does it differ from those that are maybe proximate to to it in in conceptual space? So. The idea of geometric rebalancing is that we should. So the whole goal of investing is to maximize long term growth. And if you look at it from a compound growth rate perspective, you can foundationally you can get too aggressive. You can lever too high. You can own assets that are too too volatile. And the interesting idea is that if you size a bet properly, it has a really strong uh, impact on the how it does in the long term, that it's not just picking the right asset. You really need to size the assets that you pick properly. And then when you do that in a portfolio form, um, that, of course, drives down the, the volatility of the whole portfolio. But if you size the assets within that portfolio, you can uh, you can then put yourself in a position to maximize growth. Um, and if you rebalance that portfolio as much as you as much as you can, theoretically, you have to worry about uh, costs then you're picking up a rebalancing premium, which that, that is a drinking, I guess. Damn it. You guys, are, um, I'm going to be but, getting the later ones and you're going to hate me for it. So, so the, the, the general idea is then that you need to be constantly focused on not uh, of rebalancing as often as you can, or as often as feasible and constantly trying to adapt the portfolio to the right position to reap that gain. Um, so if we're thinking from a kind of traditional finance framework, there's the uh, geometric frontier, which is kind of like the efficient frontier, but it, it's cut off on the right because you don't you don't go past the peak. 
And my view is, is that you need to be somewhere on that Jumetra frontier, potentially down into cash. There's plenty of times that even owning cash itself is, is useful. And you would be, you'd want to pick a point somewhere on that, on that frontier and constantly adjust your portfolio back to that position. Um, I think one place that I do differ from a lot of people is I view the market as, I mean, a lot of people realize that the market changes frequently. Um, but I, I think that your portfolio should very much be willing to track and adjust quickly to the way that the market moves, which is so, you know, if the market does start getting very volatile within a few days, your portfolio should pull back um, fairly quickly as opposed to just sit back and kind of wait for it to go through. Um, it may be a bad idea in the short term. It may be a bad idea on that time. But if we're thinking about it over the long term, if we're thinking about it for compounding growth year over year over year over year, you know, decades out that um, in the long run, you're better off uh, doing that and trying to trying to monitor where you are in the uh, in the portfolio setting and and maximize return. I mean, there's some similarities to, to risk parity in, in what I believe. I think I believe you should be slightly more aggressive than the standard risk parity concept. But um, that's that's, I guess, some of the view. So you mean like be more aggressive in terms of of having a view on expected returns, having some sort of model to um, to press? I also, Go ahead. Yes, I, I I do agree with I do believe that, but I also believe that you should probably be a little bit more aggressive. As, so the risk parity portfolio conceptually is the tangency portfolio, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. And I think um, obviously if you're using leverage, that's that's generally the right place to go after. But um, this is kind of one. One of the reasons I kind of attacked the blog the way I did, um, I think a lot of people talk about Kelly and maximizing geometric growth, and they instantly think that means I go straight to the maximum sharp ratio portfolio and leverage it up to a certain amount. And that that's true. Um, but at the same time, not everyone is going to use leverage. Not everybody can use leverage in their investing world and what they're focusing on. Um, and so I actually started the blog just talking purely about finding the maximum geometric growth rate without using leverage, without worrying about that. Just if you've got stocks and bonds, how would you mix them? Just those two, no borrowing of anything, just make them the best return you can. And that to me is still a maximizing and geometric growth perspective. And, and the really interesting thing about just limiting yourself and kicking leverage out of the equation is when you do that, you still get a better product from a return perspective and a drawdown perspective and a standard deviation perspective. When you look in the back tests, um, than you would if you just held like the S&P 500 or just held things. Um, and so this is where I, I guess when people sometimes say Kelly is and the idea of maximizing geometric growth is too dangerous. It's that's true if you're willing to leverage through the roof. I mean, if you look at just maximizing that stuff, theoretically, you should be willing to go short everything you own, too. You should be able to, you know, do the opposite, not just with cash, but short any assets you have. And yeah, if you start taking it to that perspective, it's crazy. But if you limit if you limit the amount that you're willing to borrow stuff, then you don't necessarily get too um, crazy with it. So my point was, is I think that to your point, um, I think sometimes people just think go, go to the, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio and, and be done with it. And I, I don't, I think there's a lot of value in thinking about where the rest of the curve comes up and rolls over and peaks for people that even aren't using leverage and um, that it's worthwhile to maybe, you know, do you, you go a little bit, little bit more risk for a little bit more reward. Maybe it's not the maximum sharp ratio, but you still get a extremely good rebalancing, bonus, you know, benefit if you're paying attention to it. Um, so I just want to unpack some of those because I think um, at the moment the conversation is sort of at the level of um, if you've read through a, a meaningful amount of your um, of your blog, and I think it's worth sort of diving a little one one level deeper and sort of what are the underlying mechanics what is being traded here what is the strat what does a portfolio look like um sure. from week to week right so conceptually i think um and and again feel free to step in um <coughs> you're sort of you're you're focusing in on two separate things one is the idea that um traditional finance focuses on the efficient frontier, which is a one period model, and it doesn't account for the effect of compounding. And that actually has a very, very meaningful impact. And if you maximize for the arithmetic mean return as the efficient frontier would have you do it, um, then you will actually not get the optimal compound return over time. Um, 
So you, the idea is let's focus on the geometric frontier because those are the actual compound returns that you will geometric. generate over time, right? You guys, um, you guys aren't playing the game anymore? Because there's been like three geometrics. I, that's true. I, I think the like way I we should do like it. We're just going to sit back and drink. Incentivize. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just to, just to incentivize people to talk. The yeah. person who's talking doesn't have to drink. You're just trying, <laughs> You're just trying to shut okay, us don't we like, exactly. Let's just Hope. take it back because there's been a bunch of questions. I want to hear the second level. So what are you trading and how are you constructing? Well, hold on. I, you yeah. interrupted yeah. me midstream. That's one theme. <laughs> the second know, theme is that of diversification, is that. right? right? Diversification, the rebalancing on. premium, right? And the way I think you've approached this is more from a permanent portfolio type of perspective where you've got kind of, um, you've got stocks, treasury bonds, gold, and cash. Um, in theory, in, in the portfolio yes. that you are reallocating to in order to maximize the expected compound rate of return. And that compound rate of return will be a function of both the, um, the um, expected return from those underlying markets. And you have a model that you use to sort of forecast returns for those three markets mm -hmm. and how effectively you harvest this rebalancing premium over time, just this premium that mathematically emerges from um, rebalancing optimally back to a, to diversified portfolios over time, right? Um, right. So did I miss anything there? And, and Rodrigo, did you then want to take it another level deeper or did I? Did no, I just wanted out? him to say the words that came out of your mouth, but that's, let's re it from No, him. no, I, I'll, I'll go over that again. Okay, so, so I, and thank you, because sometimes I can step on my own tongue when I try and talk about this and explain it to people since I, don't really have a deep background of trying to do that. Um, the I, I only trade three assets and then cash, which I still think should be considered an asset, actually. Um, but uh, and it's stocks, long term U.S. United States government treasury bonds, and and gold. And the main reason I picked those three is because um, they're generally uncorrelated to each other, so they um, they don't seem to one will go up and the other one will go down. You know, one will go up, the other one won't move. And um, when we talked about the rebalancing premium, you really can't extract extract any kind of rebalancing premium if the assets are moving together. You need them moving against each other or you know di in different ways. And the problem with most of the assets in the investing world is that they they kind of move with each other a lot. I mean, this is especially in crisis. The whole you know in a crisis, all correlations go to one, which isn't totally true, but it's true for so many assets that it kind of feels that way. So. I, I've kept this very simple, just with those three assets in cash, um, to to to, you know, to to focus on extracting the rebalancing premium as best as I can from those assets. Um, if you, I firmly believe, if you're really good and you have plenty of you know data and skill and and uh, prediction capabilities and understanding what's going on with the the market in terms of volatility and correlation, you can go well beyond that. But um, for myself and the amount of time I have to give into it, I. I felt sticking to those core assets was the important part. And as Adam said, that's kind of the foundation of the per permanent portfolio. My portfolio is a bit like that, but it's um, but it's dynamic in that, you know, if you look at the permanent portfolio, certainly over the last 40 years or so, it's kind of lagged a lot of other portfolios because it's got a lot of cash sitting in it. And it's generally compared to what most people would consider it's underweight stocks and equities. Um, and if you so my view is is that you you go out and you so you monitor the correlations and the standard deviation in the in the market what's going on between these three assets they are historically you're, you're never going to get them dead on but you know correlation and volatility tends to cluster high high correlation high volatility they happen together so if you see volatility start spiking it's likely that it's going to continue to stay high for a little while it's not likely to just dive right back down and so if you know that you can then take the, port, the the properties of the portfolio and combine it together in a way that will will maximize the rebalancing gain. Um, and I don't know if there's an easy way to, visit, to verbally describe the math behind how you do that. But um, so uh, essentially, I'll, I'll monitor what's going on, you know, in the volatilities and the correlations in the market. And when you see things start changing, then the portfolio weights will move. So if you know, a really easy example is if uh, stocks are kind of normal and everything, you know, everything's as is, but then stock volatility goes way up, then likely the, the stock levels in the portfolio will come down because 
a volatile asset like that is less likely to produce a long-term uh, long-term compound growth uh, and geometric return unless you uh, unless there's something else unless there's a reason to believe that the returns have shot up and gone higher. And so, Adam, I, I think I think some of what you were talking about is that my view. So my view of returns is that they're not very predictable and they're certainly not predictable in the very short term. But I, I do think that there's some metrics out there. I've presented, you know, one thing I've talked about in my blog was just the, the CAPE ratio and that how over 10 years, generally speaking, um, the PE ratios can kind of give a general idea of where the where the values of stocks will be, you know, a decade out. Um, and you know, I try and use things like that, you know, long term views for return projections just in. So because of that, when the volatility spikes, my returns generally don't believe that the volatility spike means stocks are about to go higher. It generally means that the stocks are about to roll over. And the same thing with bonds and the same thing with gold. So I guess that would be one interesting thing to explore as a slight difference from traditional kind of risk parity, right? Where right. Um, with the dynamic risk parity approach when volatility spikes, um, on on one one on the one hand in the numerator because well depending on how you're you're um, constructing the risk parity portfolio but let's assume that you're really just trying to maximize diversification so when you're maximizing diversification you're assuming that expected return return is proportional to the volatility of each asset so if an right. asset's twice as volatile has two times the expected excess return as another asset that's half as volatile. Um, but at the same time, you're trying to minimize portfolio volatility, right? So um, you've got this sort of push and pull, right? The expected return is going up, volatility is going up, return is going up for that asset, expected return is going up because expected returns proportional volatility. But also you're trying to minimize exposure to that on, on the portfolio level um, because you're trying to minimize portfolio volatility, right? So there is this, whereas I think on your hand, um, volatility is going up and therefore from a geometric rebalancing standpoint, you've got this sort of um, driver to reduce exposure because it's increasing at the margin, increasing portfolio volatility. But because of your expected return model, perhaps that buffers it because as it uh, typically market, especially for equities, volatility expansion usually leads to or is coincident with a drop in prices. Right. And so mm -hmm. a drop in prices may, from a CAPE standpoint, make stocks have a slightly higher expected return. And that buffers a little bit the amount of the amount that you reduce the total exposure to that to that market. So risk parity and geometric balancing actually have similar sort of directional dynamics, but for slightly different reasons. Right. Yeah. And so that's and that's a good point. And. I actually like thinking about that with for bonds a little bit better just because the bonds is very crystal clear and that like if rates if rates go up bond prices go down but rates are higher so now the belief is actually you're going to get paid more so if we look at these last you know three months in the market the rates on long-term treasury bonds have risen quite a bit and everybody was talking about you know three months ago what's the point of having bonds in your portfolio but now they actually you know they're nearly a percent higher i think in uh in return than they were a while ago so now bonds they look a little more favorable so you respond to that by actually giving them a little bit expect more expected return in the portfolio a little bit more weight even though of course their volatility has been pretty high over the stretch too so you know bonds have fallen down a little bit in my view not as much as i would have liked but they they fell down some um and then uh but now you can see that they've got a little bit higher expected return so they're they're there's there's like a buffer that says i only go so low because you're going to actually start getting a little bit of yield here or you know in stocks you're actually going to start getting a little bit of uh a little bit of you know earnings that are that are higher um so in a, in a way it, it it's a little bit that way but it to me the biggest difference between risk parity and my portfolio when things are funny when things are volatile volatile my portfolio looks a lot like risk parity um it, it it will go into a very similar structure um i think the big difference is is in a, a i guess a pretty good recent example would be like maybe late in 2017 when um when volatility in the market gets goes way down, my portfolio really, really went into it aggressively, went into went into stocks aggressively. And the reason is, is because it didn't really in, until 
stock prices started going up and earnings started coming down, it didn't take the drop in volatility as a signal that returns were any lower because the PE ratio hadn't started to reset itself by, by falling downward. And so in, in general markets compared to risk parity, I'm more willing to hold aggressive stock, you know, stock type assets. Is that, is that built into your models, that valuation metric, that fundamental valuation metric? Or you're, you're is it built with, in there with, from with the earnings? The expect, yeah. Your mm -hmm. comments on earnings is that built in somehow that it would know, or is it the expected return that you're putting in for the via Kate? Like, how, how is that, or is that just sort of an example? So what I talked about in the in the blog was, um, and and this is, I, I do a little bit more complicated things than this, and uh, what I try and do uh, normally. But you know, the blog, the simplest concept was it's the it's the earnings ratio of um, of the in this case the s p 500 because that's what i'm trading and then plus what i call the half the volatility or half the variance of, of stocks which is about four to four and a half percent and that that is in the neighborhood of what i believe is is going to be the arithmetic return for stocks going through the future so so walk us through that so that's been and just that took me a a, a couple of passes to really grasp so You've got an expected return. Um, is it that you're you're generating an expected geometric return, and then you're adding half the variance to get to the arithmetic return, and and you're using that to create the geometric frontier? Yeah. Is that well? So the thinking is, so I one of the things about modern financial theory and portfolio theory that I think is a little bit off. Sorry, is that. Um, so the stock market is a collection of, of stocks and the portfolio nature of the stock market is just going to make it act a little different than individual stocks themselves. So essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, okay, all the individual stocks, let's average out what their return is. And if, if the PE ratio of the individual stocks is, I'm saying it nearly are going to be generally around where the individual stocks are going to trend to. Um, then their own arithmetic return must be half, you know, half as much as the geometric return, since the arithmetic return is, is half the variance over the geometric return. Um, I, I first came up with this concept thinking about bonds because, you know, bonds, the general long-term return of bonds is best estimated as the yield on the bond. Um, and so what's kind of the yield on a stock? Uh, it could be the dividend yield, but in some ways I also, it's probably, I think it's more appropriate that it's the earnings yield. Okay, but uh, um, why are you adding back half the variance though? Because if because if the, the stock is going to trend somewhat towards its geometric, towards its PE ratio over multiple years, over a decade, then that return is not the arithmetic return over over the next day or the next week, all right, that, that's the geometric return because it's your it's your long-term gain. So if your return is, you know, 5% per year for the next 10 years, that's actually much closer to being a geometric return than it, is an than it is to be in an arithmetic return. So if I took that and I just took the return stream, like say on a weekly basis over that time frame, and I went back and arithmetically averaged all the weekly returns and then blew them, you know, and then you know, extrapolated them back out to an annual return, they would be roughly half the variance above the, the PE ratio. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're, you're sort of saying the earnings yield is, so, so let's assume that the prices stay constant and your only return is the compounded return of the dividends that, that are produced from the earnings, right? Um, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, yeah, you could take that concept to the dividend, but I, I, I guess... I'm saying I'm saying you're going to get your dividend stream and then the price will go up a little bit by the the leftover part that's you know being reinvested in the company that's not oh, yeah. going to return back. But your sure. assertion generally is that the expected compound return is what is imputed from the earnings price ratio and therefore yeah. you need to to add half the variance to get to the expected arithmetic return to put it into your optimizer. Correct. I got gotcha. you. Right. Which I think actually leads to, and Mike and Roddy, you're going to, I'm not sure actually if you're as familiar with this particular thesis that Matt has, but um, I'm looking forward, forward to him sort of running through it. So just 
take this concept of the equity risk premium um, as a function of basically a rebalancing premium among the um, among the stocks in the index. Yeah, just walk okay. us through this. So, because because I think this is a really novel thesis that um, be great to to pull some threads on. So this thesis. In a way, I didn't actually come up with the original concept of this. It came from ergodicity, which is a, a trip oh, drink. Great. Here we go. I've and actually been, I've, out, been, I've, I've been drinking voluntarily just because we hadn't said any of the words before. <laughs> I said a few. I was I'm trying to hold back. We got a long way to go. No, um, I, I agree. And thank you. It gets better. It gets better for at least us as yeah. time goes by. So keep drinking. <laughs> um so o Ole Peters, uh, who is the you know lead proponent and, and I, I guess the one that's came up with this a lot of these ideas with ergodicity and how they affect economics, he came up with the idea that the the stock market should be uh, stochastically efficient and that it should be trying to uh, match its optimal leverage. And long story short, he's trying to he, his his point is is that the the return on the market, the the return premium on the market over the risk free rate should match the variance of the market and if it does that then there's no reason whatsoever for anybody to leverage anything because that means any more leverage actually hurts your compound growth rate um and you would never hold cash because holding cash hurts your compound growth rate so it's theoretically has a little bit of a stability to it in that like the market should kind of you know kind of work into that general direction and there's no benefit to go to picking either other side if that's where the market finds its price return. Um, it's, I mean, I, I, at the time I thought it was an exceptionally novel idea having read a little bit more and having some people on Twitter point some things out to me. I, it's actually extremely similar to some of the stuff that mainstream economics had talked about. Bill Sharp had nearly the exact same uh, formula in some of his papers uh, as well. Um, but I had done enough work working through the concept I just talked about of, of you know, individual stocks and how do they play out but I, I kind of knew on the back of my head that at least large cap stocks, the um, over the last uh, 80 years or so, had a uh, standard deviation of about 28 percent, which is about of, about 28 percent, right? And this is I'm basing this around stocks in the Dow Jones. This so is the individual stocks in the Dow, not the, in, the, the individual, not the, not the, the standard not, deviation okay, of the index. That, no, right. no, just look no, at the no, individual no. stocks. It's, just look at the individual Got stocks it. itself. The average which is variance. About, sorry, the average standard deviation of those stocks. Correct. And okay. if you look at and so and then the um, return premium of those stocks inside the Dow is about eight percent. So. The variance, you know, twenty-eight percent squared is is eight percent. I mean, they they match up almost perfectly. Uh, interestingly, gold does the exact same thing. Gold is also over seventy. I think I did it over seven years. The variance of gold matches up perfectly with its risk premium over that time frame. I didn't do it over seventy years. I took it back to uh, seventy-one or whenever they broke the gold window. I apologize. Um, which. Is that a coincidence? I, I I don't know. It's 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 kind of surprising that it works out that perfectly for individual stocks um, to line up that well. And then there's an actual conscious reason as to an ind from an individual stock stock perspective. If the market is trying to be efficient on an individual stock perspective, it makes you can you can give a reason for why stocks would try and you know move towards their optimal leverage. Now I'm I'm sure Adam's going to explain that there's all sorts of problems with that across a wide range of stocks. But holistically, you know, it's interesting that it seems to work. Um, One thing that stands out without getting into some of the faults with Capham, going back to the fact that Sharp originally identified a lot of these structures back in the 60s, um, is what is we're sort of missing the risk free rate, right? Like um, if the risk free rate is three or four percent. No, I and, said it's it's the premium well it's the premium so it's the variance equals the premium over the risk-free rate no i hear you but the risk-free rate is four percent and the year so you get four percent for free and then you get four percent on top so it's it the question is is the risk premium four percent or eight percent right because if you take all the stocks together on like individual dow stocks they all have an average ver um, vol of 28 percent and therefore the implied premium is 8% per 
um, and you, we observe 8% in total return. Um, but some fraction of that is, is also the risk-free rate. So there's okay. some of it's missing at the index guess, level. It no, does add so, up. So what I'm saying is, is that the risk, the, the risk-free rate is four and the arithmetic return is 12. So the, the premium is eight on the, on the stocks. The total return is 12. Eh? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, ironically, at the index level, it kind of works a little better because, or, or maybe the same, actually, because um, the at the index level, um, the var- the vol is twenty percent, the variance is four percent, and the equity risk premium is four percent on a global level, right? So it's, um, I mean, if you look at at uh, Dimson, Staunton, Marsh, their Credit Suisse annual yearbook, they break down the equity premium across a wide variety of global markets and the global market of all stocks. And it's about 4.1% since 1900. And the vol is about 20%. So it's, um, you know, th- that is also an interesting and consistent data point. Is that, was that premium geometric premium or, cause the one thing I find interesting about the risk premium and the equity premium is there's no standard way to report it. It seems that is a really good question. People, That's the people, geometric people premium. report a lot of different things. So when I said eight percent, I was talking arithmetic premium, not geometric premium. Um, to be gotcha. Clear. Okay, so that that's a, that makes more sense then. Yeah, and yeah, it's a four percent geometric premium. Right. Um, okay, and that that lines up then, I guess. So my yeah, so that would line up with more of the stuff that I, I found. I, um, so again, so if <laughs> so if expected return is a function of variance then it's also a function of vol <laughs> and therefore sure. doesn't that art kind of argue in the in favor of of using vol as a proxy for expected return are you talking about back to like the risk par- parity concept yeah. yeah so the thing is though from a portfolio perspective the the vol of the portfolio is it's it's a function of the volatility of the stocks and the correlation of those stocks to each other and so if it, it, it's becomes a lot more complicated, um, you know, if, if the S and P 500 return is, is supposed to be efficient on, on those fronts. Oh yeah. I mean, there's no evidence that the S and P 500 is remotely efficient. Right. And, and, <laughs> and what this, am I is, saying? this is one of the things that I find interesting when people, and, and I realize that, you know, my, a lot of people have attacked my, this concept on, on Twitter. Other people think it's, it's great. Um, I'm not trying to say it solves all problems in the world. I think it's just a very interesting concept that when you look at the data for large cap stocks, it it kind of plays out that way. And if gold does it too, which I find, you know, once again, it could be a coincidence, but it's kind of interesting that it does it as well. Um, but um, I, I actually forgot where I was going. I think I'm, I'm saying that pretty much. <laughs> So it, <laughs> all good, all good. I mean, it's. Did I, you I, just I, say he was saying geometric too much? That's two of those. That could be geometric. That, could, that I just <laughs> said. Oh, make it three. So, so here's the first Bitcoin question. I'm surprised it took this long. We're 38 minutes in. So, um, you know, well, well done, folks. Um, so, I'm sure everyone wants to know why are we not including Bitcoin in your geometric rebalancing um, portfolio? Um, for the crowd. Yeah. I get that question every week, probably by somebody through some channel. Um, there's a lot of reason to do so. I, when I wrote my post actually on why I use stocks, bonds, and gold, I put on there Bitcoin on paper looks perfect. Like it's uncorrelated to all those. It has an enormous amount of volatility, which is really what you actually want when you're when you're trying to harness the rebal- when, when you're trying to harness the rebalancing premium. Um, <laughs> You want you want volatility. You don't really want to run from it. You're you're perfectly happy to have uncorrelated or, you know, negatively correlated volatility. So the volatility of Bitcoin is is a wonderful thing. The fact it's uncorrelated is a wonderful thing. Um, my two biggest reasons it's not in my portfolio right now is one, the data is not very deep. So you it's you know it's been around for twelve years at this point, eleven years, not not terribly long, um, and I have no idea how to project what its expected returns are going to be. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't really have a good foundation. Yeah, the I latest estimate is 100x by the next two years. So not advice. 
you know, if right. we go with that. <laughs> um, so that makes it very difficult. If you know that, then just buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> but obviously, we don't I mean, yeah. know that. Clearly, if you're willing to ride some stuff. Laser um, eyes. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget to add the, add half the variance. <laughs> Right. No, the arithmetic yeah. return to Bitcoin is through the roof. You're right. I mean, it's it's insane. And but I, I just I don't know. I don't know how to project what it's going to do in the future. And uh, I there's a part of me that thinks that I should just project it flat or nothing or even slightly down and figure out how to blend it in there. Um, the other side of the fence, and I think this is improving a little bit, is that the transaction costs are uh, they're a lot more than, you know, say, just buying the S&P 500 ETF. Um, the and, and when you're when you are rebalancing, you have to be really conscious of this. I mean, if you tried to run the strategy I try and run, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you would have gotten eaten up by transaction costs, paying people, paying commissions or paying, you know, the friction in the market. The friction's come way down over the last 20 years, which means it's possible to really go after for just um, everyday investors. It's much more possible to go after balancing techniques, whereas this mm -hmm. wouldn't have been a thing in the past. And, and Bitcoin still seems to have a, a decent, uh, decent amount of friction in it to me. Um, and, and if and to do it properly, like you, you got to be able to move in and out. So like, I can't just take it from one account and move it to like a Coinbase account. I needed to rebalance the whole thing right then. So I, you know, you need so, something within like the middle part of the financial market. And there's only a couple things right now that really fit into that. But I know Canada's got some ETFs now, and I, I've been meaning to look into those a little bit more to see if they, how they look, and if it looks more plausible. So. I mean, obviously, that the Bitcoin potentially in a front is digital gold on one of the asset classes in the portfolio that you're considering. Um, do you have concerns in other ways? For example, are you just using U.S. stocks or are you incorporating stocks from the emerging markets or have found no interest in that because the sort of correlation, if you will? It just seems to me that there are a couple of other or regimes exactly, that can, you know, instead of just just S P. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you're right about, sorry, about the lack of global equities is, is a flaw in what I'm doing. I'm way too home country biased. Um, and, uh, I would very much like to get more international exposure on there. Um, the problem, the problem with it and the way I try and build a portfolio is that it, uh, it's very difficult to accurately put things in there that have a high correlation to something else. And it's it, certainly in crisis, it's very common for um, developed markets or most equity markets in the world to become very correlated with with American stocks. Uh, and so to kind of have both of them there, it become, when that happens, then your portfolio allocations are very dependent on whatever your expected return is. Whereas um, if you have a negatively correlated stock or ne negative correlated assets, the expected return will move the portfolio uh, allocations, but it doesn't it doesn't move them from like, you know, 20% to 100% just because you're off by 1% on your projection of the future returns. It'll keep it much tighter. But with foreign equities, they become, um, when they're when they're very correlated, it can be very touchy. I, I've run models with it. I've taken developed markets and put them in as a fourth asset and run them through. And it just gets awful twitchy when it comes to back and forth. So the, the alternative to that is obviously, I think what Adam kind of said, just not using the S&P 500, using a global index yeah. into itself um and that's something i'm thinking about doing um the one thing i do like about being purely american is that i think the correlation between the u.s treasury bond and the u.s u.s based stocks is much easier to understand i guess and when they go negative i feel like they're more likely to to hold that way because it's purely u.s centric assets well um, structurally right structurally speaking you're talking about the u.s economy with right. a global currency, but a Fed that is thinking about those U.S. stocks and a business cycle that impacts the U.S. So there is a fundamental structural underlying that would link that. And then gold is sort of the third asset as the distressed, I want out of this particular stock and bond world. Right. And so structurally, there's some choices there that make uh, potentially some of the some of the impacts, I think, greater, possibly in the in the in the way the geometric rebalancing is occurring but uh, so aside from that what, what it sounds like there's some turnover and so in mm -hmm. my mind i'm I, you know when we think about sort of these even using a geometric return and you're putting in some fundamentals you would have this efficient frontier that wouldn't seem to move around a lot 
it, like as I as I walk through it with you. And yet it sounds like there are some pretty big swings in allocations. And so I'm I'm kind of curious as to what's driving that because it's it's probably not the return expectations from a long term perspective. So is it the covariance matrix that that's imparting that? Like what pieces of the puzzle are imparting these what it seem to be large implied or implied large. You haven't said how how big the swings are, but it trades a bit. It's got to have liquidity. So these are all leading me to this conclusion. So if I'm wrong there that it doesn't trade a lot, then that's fine. No, too. it does trade a lot. I mean, the, the turnover is around 400% a year. Um, it's mostly just trading small levels. I mean, it's not, it's, it, it doesn't, when like the bottom fell out of the market last March, it, it did move pretty aggressively. I think, you know, it, it, it could, it could have sold off and gone from, let's say a 60% stock portfolio down to, I, I'm making this up. Um, but maybe 30% in, uh, you know, in, in a week, a week and a half, which I, I, I think is a pretty aggressive move. Um, that should be totally. a standard disclaimer. We're making this up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, everything, yeah, no, everything is made, no, made up for illustrative. Don't, pro, pro, don't go, pro, don't go look at, I mean, I've, it's all on the blog. Anybody wants to go see what it yeah. did. I've got it published so, there, so but I'm just, don't go, don't go poke me and say, yeah. no, it only went to 35%, yeah. Matt, you're lying. And then you, I, and I, then you relever quite quickly or you reinvest quite quickly as, as, so it seems to me vol is this is a, a, a big vol is a or... yeah vol is a huge one. I mean correlation can do it too, and and I honestly think correlation will make the make the portfolio snap faster, especially when correlations shoot up towards one. Um, when when like if you're thinking from a from the geometric frontier perspective, when correlations shoot towards one, the nose of the the Markowitz bullet s shrinks in and and when it does that, like the efficient sharp portfolio becomes it's a second order effect. Yeah. Yeah. It, it dives in real fast. And so it will, it can, it can torque the portfolio real, really quickly. And it does it much faster when correlations go to one on assets than it does on others. Like if I had a, if I had a set of assets that I thought were negatively correlated, let's say we thought stocks and bonds were negatively correlated. And then it spent a week where they were moving perfectly in sync with one another. The portfolio will, will move very quickly. It's, it's very convex that relationship. Um, that's the fastest way it'll move and it, it can move pretty substantially quickly. I, I'm a, I'm a big believer of being able to react somewhat quick. I, I, I was really surprised when I got in and really reading about how other people did stuff. And I saw that people were taking, you know, decade long estimations of, of variance, uh, you know, and, and things like that for their models. And I was like, what exactly does 10 years ago have to do with what's going to happen over the next month? I, I like it to me, the standard deviation, there's standard deviation has its own standard deviation. Like you, you've got your volatility, but there's a volatility of volatility and, and you have to be prepared to adapt to that. And if you're not, you're just, you're going to be wrong constantly when the market actually does explode and you're never, you're so, never going to get it right when things are collapsing around you. If, so, you're, if you're taking data that's 10 years old into your model. Is this just but, a vol timing strategy? Then? Nani, would you mind sharing the screen? Of all timing strategy, I mean, there's aspects to that of it, um, but I. But by the way, but, no, the I, watch I think it's here. Here are the historical changes. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it. I mean, it is related to the timing of all, but it's just it's more complicated than that because the correlations I said will move it too, and as we talked earlier, if when the market does fall and the you know P ratios come down or um, or bonds fall in price so yields go up it'll it'll adjust to try and to recapture the fact that they theoretically are going to provide a little bit more return in the future so I, I don't think it's purely a vol timing strategy um yeah we can see here that just the aggressive on the in March for example your equity position went down as much as uh, down to 13 percent. And yeah, it got real. It got real tight money. about a year ago. That's almost a year ago to the day. I think it is, isn't yeah. it? That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, we we are nearly. Yeah, you went from sixty-eight percent to thirteen, and now where are we at? Around fifty-two percent, and zero cash. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Mike Harris. It's amazing, how well he did. Who's coming on strong here in the in the comment section? He he, you know, the gall of. Mike to come in halfway through or, you know, three quarters of the way through and then start lobbing questions like, is geometric return an unbiased estimator of future returns? I mean, Mike, how about a couple yeah. of softballs before you you, yeah. you come for the juggler, dude? Um, 
I mean, we did, we weren't we weren't making any strong assertions about the geometric return being an un unbiased estimator. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, is he trying to say that like past geometric return predicts future geometric return? I don't know. I think that might be. It, I don't. Think that that's that's that was implied. I, was, I don't think that's what I was trying to say. And <laughs> no, I, no, I agree. <laughs> I wanted to also offer um, something <clears throat> because you sort of mentioned adding extra assets to the portfolio that sometimes become highly correlated with other assets ends mm -hmm. up being a problem. And um, so one way to manage that, which we have found to be extremely successful, is where you have assets that all belong to the same kind of cluster. Let's say you've got US equities, EFI equities, and emerging market equities. And then you've got 10-year treasuries and 30-year treasuries and gold and commodities, just as an example. So you basically got kind of three clusters, right? You got an equity cluster, you've got a bond cluster, and you've got a um, inflation cluster, like a, a commodity cluster, right? So you just draw all cluster-wise combinations, right? So one, one portfolio is emerging markets, 10-year treasuries, and commodities. What is the optimal geometric return portfolio? Okay, set that aside. Ne the next is um, EFI equities, 30-year treasuries, and commodities. Optimize, that's the optimal portfolio, right? And you take all combinations, or if you have a much larger set of markets, you take a representative sample, like a stratified sample of them. But, but for this case, you can actually take all combinations because it's small, and then just average all of those optimal portfolios, and that allows you to avoid that so are you just um, are you you just like ensembling them together then after yeah. you've created them? Basically, yep. adding up all the portfolios equal weight, That's yeah. rather yeah. than having to choose one asset class over the other and then the next rebalancing, you choose the other class, other asset, uh -huh. the other highly correlated asset class over the other. These large shifts in portfolios. Once you do this, where you're creating unique portfolios for the unique cluster for the unique asset classes in those unique clusters and using them all, you get to include them all without the noise. I, I like that. That's good. In I, a previous I'm, life, we did a lot of work in portfolio <laughs> optimization. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand. And I, I, that's, I, that, I, that, that's, I'm going to have to dig into that a lot more. I, you know, I will say, so like I started trying to run ensembles I'm not trying, I, I am running ensembles now. And a lot of that is partially because of things you've talked about. Corey Hofstein's talked about. Um, when I first heard those concepts, I thought they were ridiculous. I, I, was like, no, you pick the best one. Why in the world are you going to like try and pick a second best one or compromise yourself? That makes no sense. And I did this knowing full well about geometric growth and rebalancing and why you rebalance assets to each other. And I heard, I heard you guys talking, I think it was on Ben Faber's podcast. And I was like, these guys are smart, but this part's ridiculous. And, uh, but then when it, it occurred to me, I was like, well, if I can rebalance assets, why can't I rebalance strategies? Like there's nothing, there's nothing different about them technically when you get down to it. And then when you look into it, it's, it's spectacular. And so I, I, that's good. I like that. Um, you can have portfolios and, and instead of changing like the parameters of the portfolio, you can change the asset in there and it does the same thing. Yeah. Um, can I just take, take it back? I wanted to understand you have an estimate for equities. When you said gold, uh, it's a great diversifier and that Bitcoin, you can't really put a pin on what the valuation is. How do you put a pin on a valuation of gold yeah, aside yeah. from, you know, the variance being equal to the long term return? Uh, you no, know, I yeah. told him you weren't going to go there, Rodrigo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I missed it. I missed the chat. I um, it. So gold, gold, gold is extremely hard to predict. Um, gold is, in my opinion, it's harder to predict on correlations. It's harder to predict on the returns and and uh, and the variance as well. Um, my prediction for gold is based around the money supply um, and the growth of how the money supply, you know, moves forward. Um, it's once again, it's it's not short term. It's it can be way off, but the the thought process is over long term. It's going to be reasonably reasonably close. Um, so if you see the money supply growing at seven percent a year, um, it's the return of gold maybe should be a little bit lower than that because the gold supply itself is growing. So it's a supply. Um, you know, supply, supply, demand imbalance situation. And that's, that's how I try and handle it. Um, but gold is, gold is a tough, tough nut to crack. Um, because it, it can so just be to be clear, you got, you got an X amount of supply plus excess mining on a yearly basis, whatever that ends up being one, 2%. 2%. Yeah. That'd be um, the minus, on the minus side. So like if, if, 
if the money supply is growing at like eight percent a year and you're mining you're mining two percent a year then the the return should be around six percent a year somewhere so so how how do how do i mean we've grown the money supply a lot like a lot so how how is that fed through the model i mean it's high powered money low powered money yeah yeah oh no you're right that's where the other m2 is up 15 percent this month again I don't know. Is it, is it really up that much this month? No, nah, it's something like that. With, with, it's the, the all the all the add up of the stimulus plan. So yeah, anyway. the money supply. I mean, it's a tough question as to what is the, even the money supply. I mean, you, you got MZM, M1, M2. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting the whole issue of what happened last year and how wealth moved from like M1 to M2 and the calculation factors of of you know what was actually which which fell into which bucket based off what Congress said and. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I generally lean towards M2 because I think it because it includes everything. It doesn't seem to affect that much, affect it as much. But um, it's it's not an easy question to answer. I, I agree with you on that. And I probably don't have an answer better than most people. Um, it's just it, but I, I don't take it over. Like, I don't so take it over like a know. month. Like it's not it's not that I'm going to say, well, money supply went up 15 percent this month. So gold's going to go up 15 percent the month. I mean, it's looking over a much longer term, just oh, like the, just it's... like theoretically that, you know, the, the whole cape right. ratio idea, the 10 year bond idea. That's not like a next month return. It's theoretically right. like 10 years in the future. So like, you know, I'm, I'm not just looking at the money supply growth over the last couple of months. It's it's a long no, term. No, of course not. We, we're going to have this pig. We're going to have this pig in the Python as you go through that, which you know, may have the lag effect to take effect when gold is, when it's realized, obviously right. it's happened and gold has gone n- nowhere but down. So obviously the short term is totally random as it should be. And the longer term is that that's the force that will drive uh gold price. Maybe, maybe also Bitcoin price to include yeah. that one in there with your, with your gold. But uh, ultimately I, I think one, Bitcoin that, in your one of the arguments for gold. <laughs> I think one of the arguments for gold is the fact that it's broadly distributed. It is um, used by the major sovereign banks. We understand hundreds of years of behavioral history around it and it's have thousands. certain characteristics, if not thousands, exactly. Um, and so, you know, there's there's certain network effects that we can count on, that have existed for for centuries that we can i think count on that create that yeah. non-correlation that we need from a rebalancing premium perspective um but further it seems to hold its its um, value as inflation becomes a thing or you know the growth of money supply becomes a thing right yeah i mean the fact that it's been around forever is yeah right i mean i've you've only got a decade of bitcoin but i've got you know century and bitcoin is not broadly distributed yet right it's right in the hands of well and, and i think so that that matters because bite your you know, tongue <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> the largest financial institutions in the world of gold i mean like maybe that maybe that'll happen to bitcoin and if it does it'll probably go through the roof but um it's been the foundation of a lot of the monetary system for so long it's you know it it, it may dwindle off i don't know but just the fact that it's i read i saw someone say that gold is the schnelling po- or shelling point of 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 the monetary system. It's been there for so long that people just instantly think of it as being in the middle of, of the financial world. And it's probably not going to disappear. Um, what is the shelling point? Okay. It's, um, I think it's shelling and not Schnelling. I could have got that wrong, but it's, 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 it's the, if you just tell someone to think of something, what would they think of? Like, I don't know much about Toronto or, or, or where you guys are, but like, there's usually like a landmark. So if you were to say like, meet me at 12 o'clock at this location, but you never told the person the location, like I live at, you know, I live outside Washington, D.C. If you did that at Washington, D.C., there's only a couple of places people are going to come to their mind. They're, they're kind of going to go Washington Monument. Maybe that's a decent choice. Like, you know, stairs of the Capitol. Like there's only a couple of places that you would think he's probably going to think there. She's probably going to think this too. And so those points are like the shelling points in people's minds. They're the ones gotcha. that they just gravitate to just in the default and so you know i've seen people say gold has got that position in people's heads but like it's just something that people gravitate to that makes sense by the way we're totally sealing that we're going to be using that you're going to hear that in every podcast right? <laughs> <laughs> i may have said that once on the blog somewhere i don't know but, you know, if i haven't i've i've thought about it um well, something's going to take over the th- we 
What's that? Used all, we used the three body problem five times a podcast for like 10 podcasts in a row. So I think this one will be a good, a good thing to take. The over selling that. point is the three body problem of the, of riffs. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to, I, I don't want to, um, let you go before talking about this idea, which I really like from as a student of sort of robust optimization. I really like the way that you, um, talk about margin of safety in the mm. context of examining the slope of the geometric frontier and, and Good. what that, what that sort of point of margin, d diminishing marginal utility and, and how to think about that. So I know that's a bit of a technical detail, but I, I, if we can try and explore it, I think it'd be really interesting. I like to try and pull it up on my, uh, on my screen and share it if I can figure out how to use the computer. Um, You're doing great so far. I mean, using the computer, I mean. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> I got I haven't been typing at the same time. So uh, which one should I? So it, it that, Ani, in the meantime, while you bring that up, put uh, alpha add or just, just define what the shelling point was. If you can put that up and let everybody was know I, what it is. Was I way, was I way off? Here we go. No, in sure game theory, a focal that. point or a shelling point is a solution that people tend to choose by default in the absence of communication. The concept was introduced by the American economist Thomas Shea. If I pronounce I bet that it's right. Thomas Schelling. I'm <laughs> oh, yeah, <there laughs> just ran go. out of space. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, um, how do I share my screen? There it is. It'll share come screen. up in a sec. For those uh, listening through audio, he's showing a picture of L. McPherson with nothing on but a gun holster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. How's, how's that look? I've never okay. been happier. So I just totally dated myself, didn't I? Like terribly. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> with that person. I have no idea what you're talking about. I know what a okay. gun holster is. So I, I came after, uh, this is a blog post I wrote called The Factor of Safety. Um, when, when you look at a geometric frontier, I don't know if I have got a picture of that, but um, it geometric frontiers, you know, they, they slope upwards like we like we see here and then they kind of roll. They roll over and they look exactly like a stress strain curve for um, an engineering material, like a beam on a on a structure or a beam on a bridge. Um, and. So when you look at the maximum geometric return, you well, hold on, get... hold on. I think it's useful to actually go into what is stress versus strain. Oh, okay. You're going to really make me remember some of my deep engineering stuff, aren't you? Okay. No, um, if it's a pain, then never mind. But I found <laughs> no, it no, it's fine. Um, so stress is the I've got it on here actually, I think. But um, stress is the amount of force or it's, it's force over area. So the, the amount of force that's on the, on the part and strain is how much it's deflecting. Um, and so as, as things go with an engineering part, as they go, you know, more and more force is put on the part, the, the part deflects further and further and further until it gets to a point that is, um, that is uh, the, it'll starts deflecting and bending and rolling over. That's where it actually yields or, or bends. Before that, it roughly holds its shape, but then it keeps bending and, and then it gets to a point where it actually starts. You have to get into a lot of deep engineering stuff to understand why it technically rolls over like this. But um, it comes to a point that if you put any more stress, uh, any more you know stress and strain on top of the the system, the system will roll over and break. Um, and so you never want to you never want to get anywhere near that point, because if you do start getting past this point, that the whole system will, will end up collapsing on itself. And that's where you get failures inside the engineering system. So when engineers deal with this, because it's extremely hard to understand what causes these kind of, you know, where, where these limits are that you can, you can obviously do a lot of testing in the field to figure out like what, you know, what the stress and strain is of, of metals or plastics and model this, but that's all, that's all the lab. Right. The real world, you know, parts that are made, they have defects in them. They may, they may have voids inside of them. They don't necessarily, they're not going to work exactly like you, you get in the lab. And, and you also don't know the kind of forces that you're going to put on them. You know, you look at, you look at cars from bridges, you know, a while ago, actually, I think cars are roughly the same weight as they used to be, but you know, the load people can put on stuff can change uh, through the years as the use changes. So you, you want to stay away from stressing things too much. And so 
um, when you look, so this is the geometric front uh, geometric frontier, and it's it's roughly the same the same shape as I said. And so, from an engineering perspective, we we try and stay away from this point, and you generally do it by kind of just part way, you know, like so you'd say like you have a factor of safety of of two, so you would move halfway, you know, you would you would take your um, your stress and you would cut it in half and then pick a point back there. But you, you, you pick your, your factor of safety based off of, um, based off of what you know about the properties. This is one sure. thing that's interesting is that like airplanes, you know, airplane design, you really don't want to like be too safe. You want to be safe, but, um, too much safety just makes the plane too heavy. And so it's, it's becomes harder to fly. So you, you, airplanes have extremely high tolerances in, in how they're made. So because they have high tolerances, they can have lower factors of safety, but places that don't have high tolerances have to have, have to have much higher factors of safety because you don't know what's, what's happening. Um, and so I'm going to, I think I'm going to change screens here. So, so that's kind of the concept of like, when you, when you talk about a Kelly point, um, You know, we keep talking about Kelly. Maybe do you want to just sort of explain the, the basic concept of, sure. of Kelly sizing? So you Kelly really understand the without understanding what maximizing is. So so that was probably missed. Yeah. So so Kelly um Kelly's I Kelly sizing to me is just about maximizing geometric growth. It's, it's, I mean, if you go back and read the actual original work, it's really about like one off coin flip kind of games and how, like, do you only bet like 5% of your bankroll on, on this horse? Um, so it's, it's got a very, very yes, no kind of, uh, view to do it. But to me, it's about maximizing geometric growth. So, so uh, the easiest thing to say, if you have like one share of the S and P 500, the, the, the optimum place to leverage it is is probably to 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 leverage it up to two to to, to two. So you'd borrow money and own two. But let's let's say let's say the the volatility is really high on the S and P five hundred, and you think the return is is still kind of low. Then that way you would actually hold fifty percent cash, and then the S and P five hundred and and that position, if you rebalance that position, creates the longest long term maximum gain. It's it's also a play on on the whole uh, Shannon's demon concept of. Um, you, you know, there's, there's a certain size to your bet that maximizes your growth. And so, um, when you do it in a multi-asset portfolio, it's a little bit more complicated in that you've got a lot of different moving parts, but it's still effectively about this point here, this, this point at the top of the geometric return is the, is the portfolio that provides the long, the, the at rebalanced at that point provides the absolute most long-term growth rates you can get. Now it may have a lot of volatility, but it's the most growth you can get. And so this, this whole geometric frontier is, is actually a frontier of, of slope, right? So the, the peak has got zero slope. What it means is, is taking on more risk, more standard deviation, you get no more return for it. You get no more long-term return. So at the peak, it's, there's no point in getting riskier. Like that's as risky as you should ever, ever be. Um, and then, then you back and you, you work your way down from that, you know, on lower slopes. Now, most people, when they talk about like a half Kelly portfolio, they just simply take the standard deviation and, and cut it in half of whatever the peak Kelly standard deviation is. So like the chart we have on the screen, it's about 18%. So a half Kelly portfolio, they would take to take to 9%. But to me, essentially the whole Kelly concept is a trade-off between the return you get from a geometric return to your next value of standard deviation, next value of risk that you're going to get. So it's it's essentially about a slope rate, a change a change in that relationship. Um, and when people talk about Kelly purely from a levering, leveraging perspective, it's a very slow, constant you know curve that slowly rolls over. It's technically a parabola, which is why that the half Kelly concept of cutting your volatility in, in half works because that's actually the point that's half the slope that you were to begin with. But if you're dealing with something that that isn't levered in that way, and it, it you know you've constrained yourself in other methods. And to me, the, the whole concept is about like, you know, how much more risk are you willing to take for this for this pay, amount of geometric return? And the Kelly portfolio is just the peak of that. It's just effectively saying that's the most you ever want to take. There's no reason to take any more risk. Now, 
you know, in real life, people, not everybody wants to take that much risk because maybe you're retired and you're going to have, uh, you're going to be pulling money out of your portfolio and the drawdowns at that level are going to be potentially, you know, dangerous because if you draw down too much, you, you won't be able to, you won't be able to, you know, achieve your future growth. So, you know, for each person, maybe that risk return rate isn't right. Um, but the Kelly point is essentially saying nobody should really go past this point. And then everybody else makes an evaluation where, you know, how far you push up the curve. And so that's where, when I, when I talk about geometric balancing, my point is, is like, this is kind of the, the peak and your point that you should be rebalancing on is somewhere, somewhere in here. Right. And now if you're going to use leverage, you should be picking this portfolio and, and moving out. But the, so the, for those listeners, what we're looking at is basically an efficient frontier where the, um, as you go up the efficient front heat frontier, you hit the maximum sharp portfolio. And if you're not going to use leverage, you're going to go up the equity market uh, or the efficient frontier more towards the the peak of that slope, which is the uh, the Kelly, the full Kelly, right? Right. And the change in expected return, which is on the on the y-axis between the maximum sharp portfolio and the um, maximum Kelly, actually is quite uh, small. So we're looking at a 5.5% return. And what is that to 6.5? And, and the, so the meat of it is, is actually in the beginning part of the slope between the sharp ratio and uh, I guess a five percentage point standard deviation. And so the, the reason that maybe half Kelly is good enough is because you're not getting much returns um, in order to, uh, to reduce that volatility. Right. At least that's what I'm, I'm seeing there in this chart. Right. And let me, let me come down a little. I think I've, yeah. So I run, I have a few charts in here showing different types of markets. I mean, these are just, just made up. There. No, but this is, this is critical because the, the point is that half Kelly is arbitrary because you don't know the shape of the, of the curve. You don't know the shape of the curve. Right. right. So you can't know anyways. You, you, yeah. Right. So half Kelly is sometimes not that good. I mean, sometimes it could be crazy aggressive. Sometimes it could be foolishly safe like it makes no sense so like um from my perspective from my slope half kelly perspective like this is just is this is actually a very this is yeah, but half kelly is a shelling point that's true it actually <laughs> probably is um Frank. but i just don't think it's always right that's i guess that's my that's what yeah thing. that's what i think that's so, what the so shelling just point said is it, it's <laughs> not right but it's just a heuristic that we use anyway keep going Right. So from like a slow perspective here, so this would be the peak, the Kelly peak here. And if you half Kelly'd it just based off volatility, you'd be holding a little bit of cash. You'd be kind of in here. But if mm. you pay attention to it as a risk return perspective, the half Kelly position should be a little bit more aggressive than the tangency point. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, from a risk return perspective, that's really where your, your trade-off matches. And then this is a pretty tame market here. Um, and so here, you know, like we're here, we were just a little bit past this from here, this half Kelly point, because the market's tame, and this is just stocks and bonds, by the way, for anybody wondering what, what this is. It's just a very simple stock bond portfolio. Um, from here, the, the actual fully, you know, fully own 100% stocks is not even peaked. And so the half Kelly point here is not remotely halfway, like because halfway is putting you back here with a little bit of cash. But the market, the risk return trade off is still quite good. So what's the point of holding cash at that point? Because you might as well be aggressive in that kind of market. Uh, I don't really know why that one's, that's roughly the same picture. And then here, so this is a really, really bent over market. So it's bent over because the volatility is very high in, in stocks at the, at the time, the stock market. And so here the half Kelly points, um, actually closer to what you would consider half Kelly, but it, it, it drove it way, 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 uh, way, way off into, uh, into a lot of cash. Um, and so this is a little bit of the way I think about this is that, you know, you, I, th I think a lot of people traditionally just pick the tangency point, which is, is risk parity can do what we're looking at right here too, where it can hold decide to hold cash. Um, but um, to me, it, you know, the risk return trade off is, is is vital to understand it, and sometimes some of the other traditional methods don't really pay attention to the risk return trade off inside of um, you know inside of the portfolio collects, selection. And I think it actually happens more often with people just being too scared that the market is actually fine and, and they go half Kelly, but that you can, you can push it up much, much higher. So just to be, just, just to make sure I understand and, and try and 
crystallize it for pe- for people listening. I think this is this pertains specifically to the un- unleveraged problem. The, you yes. know, in the levered case, um, half Kelly is the equivalent to the where the the slope is half of the the slope. So it's the, the, the optimal. Of, yeah. slope. Yeah. When you're so leveraging that, it, that's that's correct. This is assuming you're leveraging the correct portfolio, obviously. And I, I, right. You know, we all like to right. believe that that's true, but that's also probably technically never true. But um, totally. Yeah. So this is only the unlevered case where you're right. you're actually going further out the frontier. One thing I did want to highlight, actually, just if you can go back up to the top where you were showing the initial chart there, because I think I think it's interesting to note. Like, look at the diminishing marginal return yeah between the maximum sharp ratio portfolio and the optimal kelly portfolio in this plot you're like you're taking on an enormous amount of excess volatility for an extremely small amount of marginal return whereas right. if you if you can get over your leverage aversion your expected return at the same level of risk may be as much as 50 or 60 percent higher right so in this case levering the uh, the most efficient portfolio is vastly superior to um trying to push out to even half kelly here or you know the point of um of of halfway of diminishing marginal utility on the slope between the max sharp portfolio and optimal kelly right right yeah Um, this this is an extremely good portfolio to leverage some of the other ones i showed it's not much benefit to just much less more, so more equities, yeah. but this one would be very, very, very uh, what are the differences nice between, I thought it was, are these are all stock and bonds, but at different yeah. time periods. Is that what it is? Oh, I actually may have picked them on dates, but I don't think I published them. I, they're, they're theoretically just, they're just different types of markets. And I think they are based okay. off of a real market that existed, but um, at least my view of a real market that it existed, obviously, you know, what the standard deviation was at the time is up for interpretation, but. Understood. And the other so as, the other thing is basically that half Kelly is a ludicrous heuristic for an unlevered portfolio um, because it's not actually doing what you think it's doing because it's designed for the levered portfolio. Right. And if you're I, I, if half Kelly in the traditional sense is, is bad, I think if you use half Kelly in the concept of half the slope where, where you are halfway along the slope. I think it's fine um, because it's effectively just it's acknowledging it's all about a trade off of risk return. So you're just saying I'd like half exactly. the trade off. I'd like it half of it to go away. But to just 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 pick the half volatility thing, you could be making horrible mistakes if you're not if you're doing it on an unleveraged portfolio. Um, Which it, so so you need to understand the, sh- the the shape of the frontier in order to understand where the optimal trade off is, and that's not exactly, typically yeah. something that that people are contemplating. And I think it's a really right. valuable insight. And I think you explained it really well in, in your um, blog posts. And and to tie back to the margin of safety point, because we don't really know what the volatilities are, we're guessing. We don't really know what the correlations are, we're guessing. We don't really know what the turns are, we're guessing. Just like in the material, we, we kind of think we know because of past testing what the strength of this material is, but the, the you know beam has been made by somebody and it may have been nicked or it may just not be pure. You know, engineers will pick and they'll say, well, I'm not going to go to the peak. I'm not going to design this for the exact numbers that I calculate. I'm going to say I'm going to design it for less. So it's the same kind of concept of you, you, instead of saying, I'm going to go to the edge, you say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to 50%. So a half Kelly portfolio is like saying you're designing a, a bridge with a margin of safety of two. You're saying, I, I know that, I know that there's errors in this, so I'm not going to get near that. And I'm going to trust, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to buffer that off. And that's, that's kind of the way I view the margin of safety aspect of this. Yeah. So is there I, a particular really like this. brilliant? And, and is there a particular the margin of safety part? Is it a particular number? Like what, what is what is that? Is it a heuristic? Uh, so so that so actually it 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 depends on how accurate you believe your uh, your estimates are. If you if, I mean theoretically it's zero if you have wonderfully good views sure. of the future, but if you so it depends on how close you are to to having an idea of what's going on. If you have really good printers of the future, you can get more aggressive, just like airplane designers have really tight tolerances on their parts so they can actually, you know, have a much lower set factor safety and keep the weight of the plane down. Um, I, I honestly, and that part to me is pristinely useful even for leverage portfolios because 
Um, if you have a really sloppy view if, of what the future standard deviation and return are going to be, you're crazy to take leverage in any kind of quantity because you just don't know. Like that factor of safety needs to be through the roof. Um, but if you have a really good idea and if you have a method that, you know, gets it in the neighborhood and, and contemplates, you know, catastrophic failure, because it's not just accuracy, it's the consequences of that accuracy. Um, you can be a lot more aggressive with leverage. Um, in my view, I'm probably way too conservative leveraged than I should be, but. Well, this ties into a question from Mike Harris. The problem with Kelly was always over what period to measure mean return variance. It does make a difference. So have you put any thought into that? Um, well, yeah, I have quite a bit. So the, the, the return side of the house, I mean, I acknowledge that my uh, returns are kind of what they should be over 10 years. Therefore, they're terrible over the short term. Um, so that has to be taken into consideration as to how safe I am staying away from the peak. On the variance side, um, I, I think because the markets change fast, that like I said, if you're taking data from 10 years ago in your variance prediction, it's probably actually hurting you. Um, you're better off having much shorter terms. I, I did, and this was very rudimentary, but I did kind of a chart just showing if this was coin flips. How fast does it take before you get something that's reasonable? How much data do you really need in a coin flip uh, world? I think it was a coin flip world, but it was definitely a pure random world. How much data do you need before you get something kind of in the ballpark on standard deviation and correlation? Um, and I mean, it's I think I said it was somewhere between 30 and, and 60 data points. And now that's not it's not a great number, but you had then have to weigh that that accuracy against the accuracy of how much the, the market moves, like how much is tomorrow going to be? Um, yeah, let me, let me close this down. You don't need this up anymore. Can you stop sharing the screen or I can do it? Um, you have to weigh the benefit of having more data to make your, um, make your, you know, just statistical accu accuracy, uh, more accurate versus the fact that the market is changing and it's not like it was a year ago. Um, and so how do you trade that off? You're, you're giving up statistical accuracy for recency, the, the fact that the market's moving around. And that, that's a very tough problem, I agree. But I, I personally think a lot of stuff that's looked at the stuff in the past has used it very has used very long term data. They're, and um, and therefore, they're very wrong when the market goes crazy. They're still thinking the market's tame because they're pulling stuff from a long time ago. Whereas if you can shrink it down, you start getting some stuff in there and you start getting a more accurate opinion of what the future is going to be from a standard deviation correlation perspective. I mean, I, I really think the idea that you're wrong always is really important. Like you have to know everything we're putting in this model is, is wrong. Like none of it's right. It's all just guesses. And, and therefore you have to decide where, how much do you want to be wrong and where? And if, once you realize that it doesn't, it becomes okay to maybe shorten time frames down a little bit, knowing that you're, you're just trading off one error for another and you're just trying to keep them balanced. And what is the relative consequences of different types of error? Right. Um, Dave Nadig asked, um, doesn't using securities with convexity embedded solve some of the leverage aversion problem? So I guess the idea here is um, instead of using leverage, add options because it gives you non-recourse leverage and gives you convexity in the form of gamma. Um, and I think there's something to that, though. The management, now you're managing, instead of managing just Vega risk, you're managing Vega risk plus convexity risk. So the modeling gets a math lot more complicated. complicated. I, so I, <clears throat> the math is not overly hard. I mean, obviously, I'm an engineer, so I've had a decent math background, maybe um, compared to normal population. But when the when the return streams are symmetrical, this isn't overly hard to figure out to me. Uh, when you start skewing this stuff, especially to the level of options, I mean, it's it's it takes a lot of math, and uh, I don't have the capability of doing that. And, yet. and active maybe math. someday, but not now. So, yeah, you're also multiplying error terms. is quite yeah. accessible. What you've created. And once you start dealing in the, in the options world, you're managing the Vegas and the Gammas and mm -hmm. it, and you're going to have to Delta hedge and the, the like. It's it's a lot more complicated, right? A lot more data points. It's not easy to back test. So, uh, yeah, there's probably somebody willing to invest the time and energy in doing that. There's probably there's definitely something there. It's just a matter I, of what, where we're at right now with, um, I, with I, a I simple rebalancing portfolio. I 100% believe that people that, uh, no options well and understand the concepts that I'm talking about on here can use them to their benefit. I just know that the math would be very complicated. 
to figure that kind of stuff out. Um, just buy some triple bulls and just be <laughs> done with it, right? Isn't yeah. that how, is it, doesn't that maximize geometric return? No, not the triple <laughs> ones. I also think um, the other the other thing that's missed is that the use of option, options is you've in order to get convexity, you need to be long the options, and being long options means you've got carry and it's negative carry so you're constantly mm -hmm. needing to manage the like what tenor of options and um you know it, if you roll them more frequently to maximize a rebalancing premium you've got a much higher um negative carry um so there's there's lots of you've got two on two at least two unknowns and you know unless you want to go into um some of the more obscure greeks um, so, I mean, I personally look at some of these option-based strategies and in, in some of these ETFs and think um, there's a lot of built-in assumptions there and there's a lot of path dependencies. And um, actually, we got to get, had a really interesting uh, chat with Corey on Thursday afternoon about the, just some of the less well understood intricacies of just rebalancing a fairly like standard option portfolio as part of as part of a product and there's just there's lots and lots of path dependencies and, and rebalancing error and all kinds of stuff in there so mm -hmm. it's that is a um sounds good in theory um extraordinarily impractical in practice i think <laughs> poor Corey. sorry i'm not dragging you in man i'm giving you credit for having good insight um so I think we covered what what are you working on at the moment is there anything that you you're sort of got your your eye on as something that's that um because i think you, you've done a really good job of kind of digging into some of the um the fundamental um uh you know sacred cows of yeah. of finance and and um sh showing that the emperor has no clothes um so it, what are you digging into at the moment if anything that um people um, might find interesting okay a lot I, I i'm bad in that i start like a lot of posts and then i just let them sit for a while because i feel like i somewhat understand them and then i realize maybe i don't I do the them. same thing totally and then i gotta and then i gotta finish them and i'm like all right this is good but it needs like five hours of editing and i don't want to do that so and it sits for another month but um so I, there's a lot of things out there i i've been working on a something on the business cycle and kind of why it goes up and down. Um, I think it's actually related. This is surprising. I don't have any drink left, but to the geometric growth of of companies and um, me optimal, either. I'm done too. Yeah, to optimal leverage. Um, it's a hard concept to talk to over in words. I think, but that's one of the things just about why why the the market's got cycles and and they, they you know if you look at a, a chart why it goes up and down up and down up and down over time. Um, I'm working on one to talk about long, short investing from a pure coin flip example. So just the math of that, that, that one's kind of interesting in that you can have a long side that looks perfect and it works geometrically. You can have a short side that works perfect and works geometrically. And then you, but you, when you combine them together, it blows up and it will actually lose money over time. Um, and the math behind why that, why that plays out. I, that's it. I'm not a long, short investor, but to me, that's really interesting in that like you, you have two things that work perfectly unto themselves, but when you try and pair them together, because you're technically leveraging the whole thing, it won't work and it will, it will lose money over time. It's Shannon's um, angel. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> to fix that, you have to, you have to pay attention to the correlation. That was, that that was pretty perfect. good, man. You guys didn't, <laughs> no, 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 I like didn't get more right, laughs from everybody. Matt, I, I smile. I just didn't want to interrupt Matt. I thought that was fantastic, Mike. Keep going, keep going, buddy. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I appreciate your jokes, Mike. Um, but uh, yeah, I think those are the two big ones. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm doing a lot of research on the side too of just ways to improve correlation. I'm uh, I'm trying to. You know, I enjoyed your guys' talk on commodities last week, which got me a little bit more into poking into how do I put a commodity leg into this portfolio and is it worth it? Um, and uh, so you know, that's some of the stuff I'm trying to research to figure out. I would improve. Yeah. I'm going to have to figure out how to do your your uh, foreign equities uh, ensemble thing now too. But um. it's 5:30 p.m. Oh, Rodrigo's Look computer is reminding I just, us I just keep of everybody the, on time, baby. That's right, exactly. Keep everybody on time. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a that's a natural place to um, to break. Unless Matt, you've got anything else you're just dying to cover here today? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think we've. 
we've done good. The hour and a half flew by pretty quick. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's uh, you're at breakingthemarket.com, right? All this stuff that we've talked about, all the graphics came straight from that w website. So for yeah, those yeah, listeners that didn't get a chance to to watch it, um, definitely go there, look up the concepts, and it's uh, it's pretty robust and, and thorough. It's really so. cool. And I know Matt, you're, you've you put together a course for me. Uh, which, I did. Which I'm going to publish that. I'm going to publish that soon on the. I, I've I've taken Adam and I talked a week ago, and we've I went through and I kind of clustered the. Uh, clustered the blog posts into topics, kind of like the foundational entry level stuff, and then getting a little deeper into certain different directions. Um, I'm just trying to make it pretty before I hit it, so it's not just a bunch of words and got some pictures with it. But I'm going to post something on there that kind of for people that are trying to learn this concepts and get into it where to start. I mean, generally, I think that the progression of the blog itself was generally in that path, but there are a few places where I kind of looped back on myself or I got anxious and jumped ahead to talk about something else interesting. Well, the, the big challenge, honestly, with, with the way that the blog is organized is just that you've got your weekly rebalance things yeah, in between. Right. So well, you've got sort of pages and pages of that. So that, if you could that's, just. That's done. I'm not doing that anymore since I automated the whole thing. And it just, uh, it's, that's what, that's what Rod pulled up there was, uh, it's perfectly automated now. And I'll just chime in when, uh, when things are interesting enough that it's worth me talking about what's going on in the world. Yeah. Anyways, I think that that's something to look forward to. Someone asked for any book recommendations you might have. Uh, Fortune's Formula is great. Yeah, it's a fan, it's one of my favorite books of all time. Yeah, of all time. I, it's so good. That one's good because it's got enough math in it to keep it interesting and tell you what's going on. But it's also got a lot of really interesting stories. Um, gambling and intrigue and the mafia. Like it's not it's not boring at all. So, no. Yeah. As I recall, they kind of do a chapter of quant finance, a chapter of dege degenerate gambling. Right. Back to <laughs> back to quant finance. Um, yeah, you awesome. Between Samuelson and um, who was it? Samuelson and uh, the who's that hedge fund manager? Thorpe? That they feature in the book. Yeah, Thorpe. 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 It was Thorpe and Samuelson yeah. back and forth uh, between Kelly and yeah. the utility curve, right? <laughs> That right. was a, and yeah, that was, that's an interesting an section. Interesting I'm going to write about that. I, I'm planning on writing about that too. That's, I think that's a big reason why my, the stuff I talk about on the blog isn't really well known or talked through because Samuelson was totally against it. And he was probably the most popular economist in the world. And um, when you get somebody of that level writing a one syllable report, telling you you're effectively an idiot that, uh, well, no, I mean, you are applying his utility function to the fact that you're not using, you know, 100% Kelly and levering up, right? So oh, there is from that perspective. There is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the perspective that he was that he was trying to to impose on the idea that Kelly is the only thing for everybody, and and and, and Thorpe saying that anybody who's not using is an idiot. I think they both had good points. As always, uh, I think you found the happy medium. Look at you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, hey, Adam, how are you? Um, uh oh. Did we What's lose? Wrong? Yeah, he's muted again. Oh, Adam, are you talking? talking? You're muted. Oh, sir. I want to thank Adam for, for chiming in. And um, he, he's the actual lead king of, of uh, our nerdy section of FinTwit, I think. So, uh, Adam, appreciate that. That, that was helpful. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's wrap it. I actually have to take someone to a swim meet and um, this was absolutely fantastic. Super fun. Yeah. Matt. Thanks guys. I really appreciate you guys letting me on. Yeah. Been, thanks uh, Matt. Great having you. Fun. Yeah. It's been awesome. All right. Thanks guys. Enjoy your weekends and thanks yeah. everyone for joining us. Please hit oh, the like button. Smash and, the like button. Yeah. yeah. Drop a review. Um, exactly. What else do we do? Follow friends. or you know, click the follow button or whatever it is. You're better at this than I am. What is, how do you do this? I don't well, I'm not even on you guys. Listen to our things. masterclass. I think it's the, the, uh, the thing we're, we're uh, most proud of recently. Yeah, that's uh, great, by the way. I'm, I'm not all the way through that yet, but your episodes got a little longer as you got longer, uh, got, got into it. But that the first seven of those are, are awesome. I highly oh, recommend brilliant. that Thank to anyone you. listening to it to, to get into it. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. All right, gentlemen. Have a fantastic Thank you. weekend. Yep. Thanks. See you, soon. See you gents later. This episode is brought to you by Resolve Asset Management Inc. Separately Managed Accounts, available for U.S. and Canadian investors. 
While diversification is often discussed, it is important that it actually be delivered. Through the suite of Resolve Global mandates offered at varying risk levels, we aim to strike the balance between global diversification, appropriate risk balance, and directional alpha. Our portfolios are designed to safeguard and profit across many economic regimes, including periods of negative growth shocks or unexpected rising inflation, periods in which, in our view, the traditional 60-40 portfolios may fail to deliver adequate returns for investors. Resolve to improve your portfolio. Click on the link in the description to reach out to a representative and assess which Resolve mandate is right for you.